Ashley Blackbeen, Nora Roberts' book, Rising Tides, Chapter 7. I appreciate your helping me out, Mama. Helping you out? Carol rolled tiss tiss the thought away as she knelt to tie the laces on Aubrey's pink knee. Taking this cube of sugar home with me for the afternoon is pure pleasure. She gave Aubrey a chunk. A chuck on her chin. We're gonna have us a time, aren't we, honey? I'll be great doing it around. Toys! We got toys! Grandma! The babies! You bet we do, and I might just have a surprise for you when we get there. Aubrey's eyes grew huge and bright. She sucked in her breath to let out a sharp squeal of delight as she jumped down from the chair to race through the house and her own version of a victory dance. Oh, Mama, not another doll. You spoil her. Can't, Carol said firmly, giving her knee a push to help herself straighten. Besides, it's my privilege as granny. Since Aubrey was occupied running a shout and Carl took a moment to study her daughter, not sleeping enough as usual, she decided to note the strange shadows smirched under Grace's eyes, not eating enough feed a bird either, though she brought over Grace's favorite homemade peanut butter cookies to try to put some flesh on her girl's delicate bones. Child not yet twenty three ought to paint her face a little, some curl in her hair, go on kicking up her heels a night or two instead of working herself in the ground. Since Carol had said as much a dozen times or more, and had been ignored on the subject a dozen times, Times or more, she tried a different type. You gotta quit that night work, Gracie. It doesn't agree with you. I'm fine. Good hard work's necessary for living and admirable, but a person's got to mix in some pleasure and fun, or the dry right up. Because she was wary of hearing the same song, however, the notes might wet vary. Grace turned and scrubbed the hair at her already spotless kitchen kitchen counter. I like working at the pub. It gives me a chance to see people, talk to them. Even if it was just to ask them if they'd like another round. The pay's good. If you're low on cash. I'm fine, Grace set her teeth. She'd have suffered the torments of hell before she would admit that her budget was strained to breaking. That solving her transportation problem was going to mean robbing Peter to, to pay Paul for the next several months. The extra money comes in handy, and I'm going to wait your scene. I know you are. You can work down at the cafe. Have day hours. Patiently, Grace rinsed out her dishcloth and hung it over the divider of the double sink. Mama, you know that isn't possible. Daddy doesn't want me working for him. He never said that. Besides, you help out with picking crabs when we're short-handed. I help you out, Grace specifically. And I'm happy to do it when I can. But we both know I can't work at the cafe. Her father was as stubborn as two mules pulling in an opposite direction. Carol thought it was what made her, father's, made her her father's daughter. You know you could soften him up if you tried. I don't want to soften him up. He made it plain how he feels about me. Let it be, Mama. She murmured when she saw her mother preparing to protest. I don't want to argue with you. And I don't want to put you in a position ever again of having to defend one of us against the other. It's not right. Carol threw up her hands. She loved them both, husband and daughter. But she'd be damned if she could understand him. No one can talk to either of you once you got that look on your face. Don't worry. Why? Don't know why. Waste breath trying. Grace, Mom. Me either. Grace stepped close, bit down, and kissed her mother's cheek. Carol was six inches shorter than Grace's five foot eight. Thanks, Mama. Carol softened, as she always did, combed the hands through her hair, her short, curly hair. It had once been as blonde by nature, by nature as her daughters and granddaughters, but nature being, being what it is, she now gave it a quick boost with Miss Caroline. Her cheeks were round and rosy, her skin surprisingly smooth, giving her love of the sun. But then she didn't neglect it. There wasn't a single night she climbed into bed without carefully applying a layer of oil of Olay. Being female wasn't just an act of fate in Carol Monroe's mind. It was a duty. She prided herself that thought she was coming uncomfortably close to her 45th birthday. She still managed to resemble the China doll her husband had once called her. They'd been courting, and then he'd taken some trouble to be poetic. He usually forgot such things these days, but he was a good man, she thought, a good provider, a faithful husband, a fair man in business. His problem, she knew, was a soft heart too easily bruised. Grace had bruised badly simply by not being the perfect daughter he expected her to be. These thoughts came and went as she helped Grace gather up Aubrey, who need for an afternoon visit seemed to her children needed so much more these days. Time was. She would stick Grace on her lap, toss a few diapers in the bag, and off they'd go. Now her baby was run with baby of her own. Grace was a good mother, Carol thought, smiling a bit as Aubrey. Grace selected just which stuffed animal should have the privilege of a visit to Grandma's. The fact was, Carol had to admit Grace was better at the job than she had been herself. The girl listened, weighed, considered, and maybe 
That was best. She herself had simply done, decided, demanded. Grace was so biteable as a child she never thought twice about what uh, unspoken needs had lived inside her. And the guilt stayed with her because she had known of Grace's dream to study dance. Instead of taking it seriously, Carol passed it off as childish nonsense. She hadn't helped her baby there, hadn't encouraged, hadn't believed. Ballet lessons had simply been a natural activity for a girl child as far as Carol had been concerned. She had a son. She'd seen it, too, that he played in the Little League. It was just the way things were done, she thought now. Girls had two to twos and boys had ball gloves. What did it have to do more complicated than that? But Grace had been more complicated, Carol admitted, and she she hadn't seen it, or hadn't wanted to see it. When Grace came to her at 18 and told her she had her summer job money saved, that she wanted to go to New York to study dance and beg for help with the expenses, she told her she told her not to be foolish. Young girls just out of high school didn't go hair and off to New York City, of all places on God's earth, on their own. Dreams of ballerinas were supposed to slide into dreams of brides and wedding gowns. But Grace had been dead set on following her dream and had gone to her father and asked that the money they put aside for a college fund be used to pay tuition to a dance school in New York. Peter refused, of course, maybe been a little harsh about it, but he meant it for the best. He was just being sensible, just looking out for his little girl, and Carol had agreed wholeheartedly at the time. Then Carol watched as her daughter had worked tirelessly, saved every penny, mouth month after month. She'd been bound and determined to go, and seen it. Carol tried to nudge her husband into letting her. He hadn't budged, and neither had Grace. She was barely nineteen when that slick talking Jack Casey came around, and that was that. She couldn't regret it, not when Aubrey had come from it, but she could regret that the pregnancy, the hasty marriage and hastier divorce, had driven a thicker wedge between father and daughter. But what was was couldn't be changed. She told herself and took Aubrey's hand to lead her to the car. You sure this car Dave has for you runs all right? Dave says it does. Well, he ought to know. He was a good mechanic, Carol thought, even if he had been the one to hire Jack Casey. You know you could borrow mine for a while, give yourself more chance to shop around. This one will be fine. She hadn't even laid eyes on the second-hand today, and David picked out for her. We're going to do the paperwork on Monday. Then I'll have wheels again. After scurrying Aubrey in the car seat, Grace slipped in while her mother took the wheel. Go, go, go fast, gamme! Aubrey demanded. Carl flushed when Grace cocked around. You've been speeding again, haven't you? I know these words like the back of my hand, and I haven't had a single ticket in my life. Because the cops can't catch you. With the left, Grace strapped herself in. When do the newlyweds get home? Not only did Carol want to know, she preferred to have the conversation veer away from her notorious heavy foot. I think they're doing about eight tonight. I just want to get the house a buff. Maybe put something on for dinner in case they're hungry when they get here. I imagine Kim's wife will appreciate it. What a beautiful bride she was. I've never seen lovelier. Would you manage to get that dress when the boy gave her so little time to plan a wedding? I don't know. Seth said she went to D.C. for it, and the veil was her grandmother's. That's fine. Have my wedding veil put aside. I always imagine how pretty it would look on you on your wedding day. She stopped and could cheerfully have bitten her tongue. It would have looked a little out of place in the county courthouse. Carol sighed. She pulled into the Queen's driveway. Well... You'll wear it next time. I'll never get married again. I'm not good at it. Warm mother gaped at the statement. Grace climbed quickly out of the car, then leaned in the window and kissed Aubrey Tony. You be a good girl, you hear? And don't let Grandma feed you too much candy. Grandma has chocolate. Don't I know it? Bye, baby. Bye, Mama. Thanks. Grace, what could you say? You, uh, you just call when you're done here, and I'll come and pick you up. We'll see. Don't let her run you ragged. Grace headed and hurried up the steps. She knew she timed it well. Everyone would be at the boat yard working. She was determined not to feel awkward about what had happened the night before last, but she did. She felt miserably awkward, and she wanted time to settle before she had to face Ethan again. This was a home that always felt warm and welcoming. Caring for it soothed her, because she knew that a large part of her motivation for working on it that afternoon was self-serving. She put more effort into the job. The results would be the same, wouldn't they? She thought guiltily as she ran the other old buffer over the hardwood floors to make the wax gleam. Anna would come onto a spotless house with a sense of fresh flowers, polish, and porpory before fume in the air. Women shouldn't have to come home from a honeymoon to dust and clutter, and God knew the Quinn men generated plenty of both. She was needed here, damn it, and all she was doing was proving it. 
She spent extra time in the master bedroom, fussing with the flowers. She begged off Irene, then changing the position of the vase half a dozen times before she cursed herself. Anna would put them where she wanted them to be anyway, to remind herself, and would probably change everything else while she was at it. More than likely, she would want new everything. Grace decided that she pressed the curtains. She washed until... Now, the tiny wrinkle showed in the thin summer sheets. Anna was city bred and probably wouldn't care for the worn furniture and county two touches. Before you knew it, she'd have things staked out in leather and glass and all of Dr. Quinn's pretty things would be packed up in some box in the attic and replaced with pieces of sculpture nobody could understand. Her jaw tightened as she rehung the curtains, gave them a quick fluff. Cover the lovely old floors with some fancy water wall carpet and paint the walls some hot chocolate that made their eyes sting. Resentment bubbled as she marched into the bathroom, put a bunch of early rosebud in a shallow bowl. Anybody with any sense could see the place only needed a little care. A bit more collar here and there. If she had any say in it, she stopped herself, realizing that her fists were clenched in her face, reflected in the mirror of the sink. Was perhaps, oh, Grace, what is wrong with you? She shook her head, nearly left herself. In the first place, you don't have any say, and in the second, you don't know that she's going to change a single thing. It was just that she could, Grace admitted, and once she changed one thing, nothing was quite the same. Isn't that what had happened between her and Ethan? Something had changed, and now she was both afraid and hopeful that things wouldn't be quite the same. He thought of her. She mused and sighed at her own reflection. And what did he think? She wasn't a beauty, and she never... Filled out enough to be sexy now and then. She knew she caught a man's eye, but she never held it. She wasn't smart or particularly clever. Had neither stimulating conversations nor flirtatious ways. Jack had once told her she had stability. And he convinced them both for a while that that was what he wanted. Be but stability wasn't the sort of trait that attracted a man. Maybe her cheekbones were higher, or her dimples deeper, or if her lashes were thicker and darker. Maybe if the filthy curl hadn't skipped a generation, left her hair straight as a pin. What did Ethan think when he looked at her? She wished that she wished she had this courage to ask him. She looked and saw the ordinary. When she had danced, she had felt ordinary. She felt beautiful and special and deserving of her name. Dreamily, she dipped into a palite, setting crouch on heels, then lifting again. She had sworn her body sighed in pleasure, dodging herself. She slowed into an old, well-remembered movement in an all slow pirouette. Eat this! She squeaked it out, collar flooding her cheeks when she saw him in the doorway. I didn't mean to startle you, but I didn't want to interrupt. <laughs> oh, well, mortified, she snatched up her cleaner hat, twisted her I was just finishing up in here. You always were a pretty dancer. He promised himself he would put things back the way they'd been between them, so he smiled at her as he would have been. You always dance around the bathroom after you clean it. Doesn't everybody? She did her best to answer his smile, but the heat continued to sting her cheeks. I thought it'd be done before y'all get back. I guess the floors took longer than I figured on. They look nice. The pool's already had a slide. Surprised you didn't hear it. I was daydreaming. I thought I'd... Then she managed to clear her brain and get a good look at him. He was filthy covered with sweat and grime and God knew what. You're not thinking of taking a shower in here? He's in the door. It crossed my mind. No, you can't. He shifted back because she's taking a step forward. He had a good idea of just how he smelled at the moment. It wasn't a, that was reason enough to keep his distance, but worse, she looked so fresh and pretty. Taking us on vow, I'll touch her hand, and he meant to keep it. Why? Because I don't have time to clean it up again after you or the bath downstairs either. I still have to fry the chicken. Thought I'd make that in a bowl of potato salad so you wouldn't have to worry about heating anything up when Kevin and Anna got home. I have to deal with the kitchen after, after so I just don't have time, Ethan. I've been known to mop up a bathroom after I've used it. It's not the same. You just can't use it. Flustered, he took off his cap. Dragged the hand through his hair. Well, then, that's a problem, because we've got three men here who need to scrap off a few layers of dirt. There's a bay right outside the door. But here, she opened the cabinet on the sink. Fresh bar soap. Damn if she'd have them use the pretty guest soap she'd set out in this. I'll get you towels and some fresh ones. But you will want Ethan to tell the others what I said. She the soap in his hand. You're already scattering dust everywhere. Scrowled it soap in her. You think the royal family was dropping by for a visit? Damn it, Grace. I'm not stripping down on my skin and jumping off the dock. Oh, like you've never done it before. Now with a female around. I've seen naked men a time or two, and I'm going to be too busy to be take Polaroids of you and your brothers. Ethan, I've just spent the best part of my day getting this house to shine. You're not spreading your dirt around. 
Disgusted, disgusted his experience. Arguing with a woman's made up mind. It was painful and fruitless. I was banging her head against a brick wall. She had the soap in his mouth. I'll get the damn towels. No, you won't. You hands some filthy. I'll bring them out. Muttered to himself. He went downstairs. She was actually to the bathroom arrangement. Was a shrug. Bathroom arrangement was a shrug. Stress. Chest was pure glee. He darted outside, calling for dogs to fall, and sent shoes, socks, shirt, scattering as he raced for the dock. <laughs> He'll probably never want to take a regular bath again. Philip commented, sat on the dock to remove his shoes. He's remained standing. He was taken off a blessed thing until Grace delivered the towels and clothes and was back in the house. <laughs> what are you doing? He demanded when Philip pulled a sweat stained t shirt over his head. I'm taking off my shirt. Well, put it back on. Grace is coming out. Philip glanced up, saw his brother's perfectly serious, and left. Get a grip, he said. Even the sight of my amazing and manly chest is not likely to send her over the edge. To prove it, he rose and shot Grace grin as she crossed the line. I heard something about fried chicken, he called. I'm about to get to it. When she, when she reached the dock, she set the towels and clean clothes in a neat pile, then straightened, smiling out to where Seth and the dog splashed. She managed, she managed they scared every bird and fish away for two miles. This arrangement suits them just fine. Why don't you take a dip with us? Philip suggested and swore he heard Ethan's jaw crack. You can scrub my back. She laughed and picked up the clothes that had already been discarded. It's been a while since I've gone skinny dipping, and as appealing as it sounds, I've got too much to do to play right now. You give me the rest of your clothes, I'll get them washed before I go. Appreciate it, but when Philip reached for his belt buckle, Ethan jabbed him in the elbow. An elbow in his ribs. You can wash them later if you're set on it. Go in the house. He's shy, Phil Wiggles. I'm not. Grace only laughed again, but she had to back to the house to give them privacy. You shouldn't tease her that way. He's a member. I've been teasing her that way for years. Phil peeled himself out of his work stained jeans and allowed to be rid of them. Now it's different. Why? Phil started to slip out of his slip boxers and caught the look in Ethan's eyes. Oh, well, well. Why didn't you say so? I've got nothing to say. Because Grace was in the house now. He couldn't imagine her pressing her nose to the window. He pulled off his shirt. It's her voice that always got me. Huh? That throaty sound. Philip continued, please be able to rile. He said about something. Low and smooth and sexy. Threatening his teeth. <laughs> He's in pride off his work boots. Maybe you shouldn't listen so hard. What can I do? Can I help it if I have perfect hearing? Perfect eyesight, too. Yeah, judging the distance between them. And as far as I can see, there's nothing wrong with the rest of her either. Her mouth's particularly attractive, full, shapely, unpainted. Looks tasty to me. He took two slow breaths as he tugged off the Are you trying to irritate me? I'm giving it my best shot. He said, stood. Gage his man. You want to go in head first or feet first? Please, Philip grinned. I was going to ask you the same thing. Both ways to beat and charge, grappling with sets to brows and cheers, ringing, wrestled each other in the water. Oh, my. Grace stopped with her nose pressed up against one of Oh, my. If she'd ever seen two more impressive examples of the male form, she couldn't say when. She only intended to sneak a quick glance, really, just one innocent little peek beneath and had pulled off his shirt, and, well, damn it, she wasn't a saint. And what harm did it do to anyone to just look? He was just so beautiful, inside and out, and, God, if she could get her hands on him again for just five minutes, she thought she could die a happy woman. Maybe she could, since he wasn't indifferent the way she'd always assumed he was. There'd been nothing indifferent in the way his mouth had crushed down on hers or the way his hands had rushed over her. Stop. She ordered herself a step back from the window. The only thing she was going to accomplish this way was to get herself all worked up. She knew how to channel her more intimate needs, and that was to work until they passed away again. But if her mind was completely on her chicken, who could blame her? She had the potatoes cooling for the salad and the chicken frying when Philip came back in. Gone with the image of the sweater swing labor in his place was a smooth, the gilded, the casually sophisticated. He winged her. Smells like heaven in here. I made extra so you can have it for lunch tomorrow. Just put those clothes in the laundry room, and I'll see to them in a minute. I don't know what we do without you around here. She bit her lip and hope everyone felt the same. Is Ethan still in the water? No, he and Seth are doing something to the boat. Phil went to the refrigerator and took out a bottle of wine. Where's Aubrey today? With my mother. In fact, she just called and wants to keep her a little longer. Guess one of these days I'm going to have to give in and let her stay overnight. She glanced down, wiggling at the glass of cool... Golden wine he offered her. Oh, 
Thanks. What she, what she knew about wine would fill a tibble while she sipped because it was expected in a bristle. This isn't anything like what they served out at the pub. I wouldn't think so. Consider what they call the house white down the shinies. One shaking stuff from a horse piss. How are things going there? Fine. She gave serious attention to her chicken, wondering if Easton had mentioned the incident. Unlikely. She decided when Philip didn't press. She relaxed again and let Philip entertain her while she worked. He was always full of stories, she amused her easy, even careless conversation. She knew he was smart and successful and had slipped into city living like a duck in water, but he never made her feel inadequate or silly, and in a cozy way, he made her feel just a little more feminine than she had before he come into the room. That was one why Grace's eyes were laughing and her mouth purely curved when Ethan came in. Philip sat sipping wine while she put the finishing touches on the meal. Oh. Oh, you're making that up? I swear. Philip held up a hand and oath grinned as Ethan came in. The client wants the goose to be the spokesperson, so we're writing dialogue. Goose Creek jeans. Fine feathers for everyday living. That's the silliest thing I've ever heard. Hey, Philip, tell. Hey, Philip toasted her. Watch them so. I've got a few phone calls to make. He rose slowly round the table to kiss her and make Ethan seize. <laughs> Thank you for feeding us, darling. He strolled out, whistling. Can you imagine making a living writing words for a goose? <laughs> Amused Grace shook her head. She tucked the bowl of potato salad in the refrigerator. Everything's done so you can eat when you're hungry. Your clothes are in the dryer. You don't want to leave them sitting in there after it's done or they'll be wrinkled. She moved around tightening the kitchen ash. I'd wait and fold them for now, but I'm running a bit behind. I'll drive you home. I'd appreciate it. I'm doing with the car on Monday. Until then, she lifted her shoulders and saw with one last glance that she had nothing left to do. Still, she eyed every nook and corner as she walked through the house in front door. How are you getting to work? Ethan demanded when they were in his track. Julie's taking me. Shiny's taking me home himself. She cleared her throat. When I explained what happened the other night, he was upset. Not mad at me, but really upset. It had happened. He was set to skin Steve, but under the circumstances. They had a boy, by the way. Eight and a half pounds. They're calling him Jeremy. I heard. Was Ethan's only comment. Now she drew a blushing breath. About what happened, Ethan? I mean, after I've got something to say about that. He worked it out carefully. Where before. I shouldn't have been mad at you. You were scared and I spent more time yelling at you than making sure you were all right. I knew you weren't really mad at me. It was just, I've got to finish this. I said, but wait until we turned into a driveway. I had no business touching you that way. I promised myself I never would. I wanted you to. Though the quiet words caused his stomach to clench, she shook his head. It's not going to happen again. I've got reasons, Grace, good ones. You don't know and you wouldn't understand. I can't understand if you don't tell me what they are. He wasn't going to tell her what he'd done or what he'd been done to him and what he was afraid still lurked inside him, ready to spring out if he didn't keep that cage lock. There are more reasons. He shifted to look at her because it was only right to say what he had to say. Face, I could have hurt you, and I nearly did. That's not going to happen again. I'm not afraid of you. She reached out to touch, to stroke his cheek, but he grabbed her hand and held her off. You're never going to have to. You matter to me. He gave her hand a quick squeeze and relief. You always have. I'm not a child anymore, and I won't break if you touch me. I want you to touch me. Full, shapely, unpainted lips. Phillips were second and said, Now he's a new. God help him exactly how tasty they were. I know you think you do. That's why we're going to try to forget that the other night happened. I'm not going to forget it, she murmured in the way she looked at him. Her eyes soft and full of need and made his head swim. It's not going to happen again, so you stay clear of me for a while. Desperation tinted his voice as he leaned across the shoulder of her. I mean it, Grace. You just stay clear of me for a while. I've got enough to worry about. All right, Ethan. She wouldn't beg. That's what you want. That's exactly what I want. This time he didn't wait until she was in the house, but backed out of the drive the minute she closed the truck doors. For his first time in more years than he could count, he thought seriously about getting blind drunk. End of chapter 7